bet that's that's exactly they're going through exactly what we're going through now with these vaccines. You know? <laughs> it's basically the same. Yeah, it's, it's basically the same thing. It seems to be a fan of conspiracy theorists to bring this up. I hear Alex Jones bring it up quite a bit um, to justify, you know, all the just to, to justify some weird conspiracies about, you know, this is why American elites are are involved in all this demonic satan, satanic stuff because they they derived from these Nazi blood rituals that they started taking part of as a result of Operation Paperclip. So. I'm assuming that's what this is about. This is why Hillary Clinton t- gets babies for her adrenochrome. Right. Not sure that premise follows to that conclusion. Uh, okay. I mean, you could make some other points about American elites supporting the Nazis before, during, and after Operation Paperclip, mm-hmm. but we're, we'll we're, we'll get there maybe. Um, okay. So this begins at right at this this book. I read through it pretty thoroughly a couple times. It begins at the end of World War II as Russia is advancing on Berlin from the east. Allied forces are advancing on Germany from the west and the north. We're not going to go through the whole thing today, obviously. We'll just uh, kind of get started on it. But um, So where do we begin the story? It's written in a sort of narrative style, but it's uh, just a lot of information uh, and a lot of historical context. Very, very fascinating. This is Castle Varlar in uh, Germany. This is where it begins. There we go. Check that out. That's badass, dude. Yeah, that is. I want a badass. castle. Uh, well, this was a Nazi castle. Uh, Hitler was hosting a party here, celebrating the accomplishments of the V2 rocket program, handing out awards to the scientists. While he was doing all this and having this party, they were launching V2 rockets off into northern Europe from <laughs> the grounds here. In between rocket launches, he was handing out uh, medals to these scientists. 2,000 pounds of explosives in each rocket. I don't know if you know anything about the V-2 rocket, but this was the beginning of basically the space program in the world, really. You are watching captured German films of the top secret Nazi research center at Penamunda, a base on an island in the Baltic Sea. It was here that German scientists developed the first rocket to travel faster than the speed of sound. When it was unleashed on London, it gave no warning of its approach. You heard the explosion before you heard the sound of the missile. The results were... Pretty terrifying, man. Yeah, that's scary. So the thing explodes before you hear it fall. Hmm. Uh, Right at the same time, Germany had been stockpiling millions of tons of deadly chemical weapons-filled rockets, V-2 rockets, that lay in secret bunkers. Um, And there was all this inner talk amongst uh, Hitler's circle, wondering whenever Hitler would uh, pull the trigger on the chemical weapons. He never did, thankfully. Um, this uh, This is a few months after the Normandy Beach invasion, so this was the beginning of the end for the Third Reich, basically. England knew... uh. Uh, the Western forces knew about the chemical weapons. In England, they issued 4.3 million gas masks to uh, citizens. And uh, the, city pe- the city people were told to pray. Here we're introduced to Major General Walter Dornberger, who would soon be working for the Americans. He was the man in charge of the rocket programs for the German army. And he often appeared in photos alongside Heinrich Himmler. So this is Dornberger on the left. He's a he's he's pretty young, man. I don't know how he got promoted so quickly, but uh, this is Heinrich Himmler here, and I believe this is Albert Speer on the right. Although I'm not sure, it's hard to tell from the profile pic. Look at the Himmler dude. He's such a goober. Look at this dude. Yeah, reminds me of, like one of my uncles or something. <laughs> he does look like somebody's uncle. Look at them jackets, though, man. The things are like they're way too big on them. Well, they have the belt look, on the outside of the jacket. Pretty strange yeah. fashion choice. Look, look! Look how far the the sleeve comes down over the hand on Himmler and uh, and our boy over here on the on the far Dornberger. left. Well, he's still growing. Yeah. He's a growing boy. Let me roll them sleeves <laughs> up, maybe. 
Yeah, that's exactly. That's that's what I look like when I got my hand down, hand me down. Well, so I was like eight years old. Very, very, very cold uh, this time of year. We'll get to that in a little bit. This particular year was even more cold than sort of normal. But yeah, very weird fashion sense. These guys I think they were a little, little fancy. Seemed you know like a I mean? happy crew though. Bunch of happy guys. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Bunch of nice chaps. What's the? How bad could they be? How bad could they be? They're smiling. They seem. Genuinely happy. Uh, also, at Castle Varlar was Werner von Braun. This was uh, another one of the uh, heads of the rocket program. He was a rich, rich aristocrat um, and head of the Nazi rocket program. Uh, he would also be working for the Americans, and um, he was probably the most celebrated of all these Nazi scientists in America once he got here. Still to this day, he's sort of considered, you know, a, a sort of a almost an American hero. Um, strangely enough. Handing out awards that night at Castle Varlar was Albert Speer, who we saw on the right here with the crooked nose. The group returned to the island facility at Penamunda, where a short time later, the group would once again be celebrated after a V-2 rocket smashed into the Rex Cinema in Antwerp, Belgium, killing 567 people, half of whom were Allied servicemen. And this is the largest uh, death toll from any single V-2 rocket uh, attack. Hitler believed he could salvage the war with these rockets. More than 10,000 were fired at the Allies. They did cause initial panic to Londoners when first introduced, but they had little military impact on the course of the war. For the Nazis, it was too little, too late. For them, the war simply ended a year too soon. Yeah, so historians are saying there, basically, if Hitler had one more year, he might have been successful with the V-2 rockets. Particularly when you factor in the chemical weapons. Um, but yeah, the V-2 rocket, the propulsion system was very advanced for its time. They had two gyroscopes that would control the trajectory of it. And uh, basically what would, what the engineers would do is they, they would calculate how far it would travel um, based on the amount of fuel they put in it. And that would determine where it would roughly land, that and the traje trajectory. And once it ran out of fuel, it just dropped and then exploded where it landed. That's how the V-2 kind of worked. But, you know, it was the very beginnings of uh, basically rocket technology. Part two, we are, are in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Here we meet Dr. Otto Ambrose. He is basically the main sort of character of the, of the book. He's the most referenced individual, and he has the most, most shit goes on with him. Um, very slimy, and he's also very very protected and taken care of by the Americans all throughout his sort of career here. There's his um, Nuremberg trial photo. Yeah, he looks like the uncle that gave you beer and molested you. Well, he molested the entire planet um, because yeah. he was... Hey, Himmler, rich... looks like the, Himmler looks like the happy uncle. He does not. He looks like the yeah. He looks like the uncle that you want to keep your kids away from. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't talk about that, <laughs> especially with the. I mean, the hair, dude. Oh, yeah. God. Some people have those eyes, those like crazy eyes that just stare at you through a photograph. You know, Rasputin has those kind of eyes. And this guy has them too. Uh, I get a little weirded out just looking at the pic. He seems too happy to be incarcerated, doesn't he? He's like, I know this isn't going to go anywhere. Do you know who I am? He was the manager of IG Farben, a chemical company working for the Third Reich. IG Farben was a conglomerate of merged companies, including names like Bayer and BASF, the largest company in Germany at the time and the largest chemical company in the world at the time. George von Schnitzler, an IG Farben board member, was present during the, quote, secret meeting of 1933 between Hitler and corporate elites. So he wasn't there personally, Otto Ambrose, but he sent a representative, basically, this uh, von Schnitzler, quoting from a paper by Daniel Crane at the University of Michigan. Quote, Farben played an early and critical role in developing the finances of the Nazi Party on fe February 27th, 1933, perhaps not coincidentally the day of the Reichstag fire, Farben deposited 400,000 Reichsmarks in the Nazi Party's coffers, the largest donation by any firm by a large order of magnitude. And uh, staff of the Bayer Group, which is... Uh, was a subsidiary of IG Farben, was found to be conducting medical experiments on human beings. Most of the experiments were done on women, presumably so the men could be used for slave labor. M many of these experiments involved 
deliberately infecting women with typhoid, tuberculosis, and diphtheria, and then giving them random shit to see what happened. There was also experiments detailed in the Nuremberg trials uh, that she mentions in the book also. Uh, there was one specific case where they sliced a chunk out of this woman's uh, calf bone or femur bone, one of the bones in her leg, while she was not sedated or anesthetized in any way, mm. and then infected it with gangrene. Um, and luckily she survived, and she testified at the Nuremberg trials, but many people who received similar sort of experiments didn't survive. Most of them didn't. <clears throat> a subsidiary of IG Farben, Degesh, supplied Auschwitz with Zyklon B. Uh, there's this gentleman named William Rudolph Mann, who was a director of IG Farben, and he was executive chairman of the Degesh board. He was a storm Fuhrer in Hitler's SS. He was acquitted at Nuremberg and later became the director of sales for Bayer. Other IG Farben board members also went on to do great things after being acquitted. They did this, IG Farben had their own trials at Nuremberg, and most of them were acquitted or given light sentences. And the sentences they were given were drastically cut short by the uh, U.S. basically just, military just, judge over the overseeing these cases. Just to interject real quick, Bayer, yeah. you mean Bayer aspirin, like Correct. that Bayer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, of these, obviously Bayer, Bayer aspirin Bayer is still around today. Uh, were any of these other corporations, are they still functioning They're still around. Or? Most of them you wouldn't recognize the names except for Bayer and BASF. <laughs> Yeah. Basically, what happened yeah, is after yeah, the war, yeah, after the war, the United States broke up, rebroke up IG Farben into its constituent parts, mm -hmm. but the constituent parts continued to operate basically as a cartel um, for for decades. I guess I don't know. Maybe that stopped at some point. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe it didn't. I mean, these are large chemical companies still today. Um, BASF is. I mean, I know the name, so I mean, I, there's others too that I, I probably recognize. But they're European companies. Yeah, BASF, so. BASF. They make. Uh, like uh, electrical Bolt tape chemicals, and, uh, yeah, uh, other rubbers and rubbers and plastics, mostly adhesives. Yeah, this was um, what Otto Ambrose was famous for. He it, he developed a way because once Hitler invaded, there was no really oil reserves that he had. So Otto Ambrose um, and these other scientists devised this way to produce rubber and uh, diesel fuel from coal. Oh, I wanted to show some photos of Auschwitz. If you, anybody who maybe have watched my fascism video would know, but, um, for example, at Dachau, two-thirds of the prisoners at Dachau were political prisoners. Um, obviously, the Final Solution targeted Jews, but um, the first concentration camps were for political prisoners. Um, here is the IG Farben rubber plant, uh, basically, one of the plants that use slave labor here at Auschwitz. at the time, and here's a photo from today. Oh, not, not today, but you know, modern day. Look at, notice the, the fences, notice the fence. See how the barbed wire like curves in? So I guess the wall's still there from. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Can't have any of the workers run it off. Ugh. Uh, the, the people who worked there called it Buna because Buna was the name of the synthetic rubber. At Buna, uh, basically what happened was they, the, the Germans would uh, sell these uh, slaves to IG Farben for, you know, like 20 bucks a day or whatever it was, um, and they would work them to death. At Buna, the average lifespan of a slave laborer was three months. Um, and, okay, so we go back to the story at this point. Um, some of the remaining Nazis are destroying the crematoriums um, at Auschwitz. We are at Auschwitz right now. Others rounded up the enslaved Jews, Soviets, Socialists, Poles, Slavs, and others with whips and attack dogs and began to brutally march them across the frozen European landscape. Here's a quote from the, uh, from the book. Wearing thin pajamas, the prisoners at Buna began a death march toward the German interior. Within 48 hours, 60% of them would be dead. Otto Ambrose was awarded 1 million German Reichsmarks. Uh, we mentioned that already. He was convicted at Nuremberg and sentenced to eight years. He served three years before being granted clemency by the U.S. High Commissioner, Commissioner to, German, to Germany, John J. McCoy. 
That's a lot of J's. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened was, apparently, according to Annie Jacobson, public sentiment in Germany started turning against the Americans, sort of, basically. And uh, they were, there, was, there was political pressure on uh, the U.S. Uh, military commission to, to sort of reduce these sentences. Because it was sort of, uh, it was a situation where they, it was like the Americans doing shit in Germany still. Uh, he, he served less time than like a, a drug trafficking charge would give you. Three years. As you do. Uh, for the murder of tens of thousands of uh, people for the production of capitalist corporations. All right, the real reason the U.S. wanted Otto Ambrose, it wasn't for the uh, synthetic rubber. There's Dyrenfirth. This is where we're going to next in the story. This is where Hitler kept his closely guarded secret, uh, Taben nerve gas. This is a cousin of sarin nerve gas. And he had thousands of pounds of this stuff stockpiled, man. Um, this was an underground facility managed by Otto Ambrose, the gentleman we were just speaking about, uh, at this underground production facility. They had 3,000 slave laborers producing bombs filled with Hitler's most closely guarded secret, tape and nerve gas. One tiny drop to the skin could kill an individual in minutes or seconds. And this was useful to the German Reich because you didn't, gas masks wouldn't prevent death from this substance. So if oh the enemy soldiers were wearing gas masks, <clears throat> It didn't matter. If it got on your skin, you were dead. <clears throat> Jesus. Um, Can you imagine working in that factory? Your slave laborer in a factory making something like that? It's... They talk about it, dude. Uh, yeah, it's, oh. it's disturbing. Yeah. Obviously, the workers died frequently uh, from the nerve gas. They had no. basically spacesuits. They were wearing spacesuits, but the... the uh, the prisoners were saying that the, the the air tubes were way too short, and they would like pull the tubes off accidentally all the time, and they would just instantly die. <laughs> horrifying, dude! Horrifying stories. I mean, some of this stuff I covered the Nazis when I was younger, but a lot of this information has just been released uh, in the two thousands. I bet that's ex that's exactly they're going through exactly what we're going through now with these facts today. <laughs> you know. It's basically the same, yeah. It's, it's basically the same thing. I have to get a vaccine or get tested. They had to work with no med with no uh, safety equipment around deadly nerve agents. So, yeah, I mean, feel for them. It's oppression, oppression, Tony. <laughs> oppression, either way. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. All right, we are then introduced to Doctor Walter Schieber. He he was Albert Speer's director of the Armament Supply Office. He was a member of Himmler's personal staff. According to Annie Japes Jacobson, he was, a, uh, quote, unusually corpulent for an SS officer, but he wasn't that fat. He was just a little overweight. Uh, she's being a little uncharitable to, to Sheber there. Well, it was, it was like 20 pounds overweight back then was morbidly obese, so. Yeah, I mean, for the, I yeah, I mean, compared to all the, all, compared to all the Auschwitz prisoners, he's probably fat as hell. Yeah. Um, Schieber had been responsible initially for the production of 46 million gas masks for the Germans, um, and the reliability of the gas masks were tested at Dyrenfurth on concentration camp prisoners. They would lock the prisoners in glass rooms and spray them with nerve agents. And as we just mentioned, Tabin really went around the gas mask. It wasn't an issue, so this was the, uh, and this is uh, presumed to be the sort of origins of the gas chamber, uh, these tests that they did. <clears throat> As the Soviets approached, IG Farben faculty fled. The Nazis scrubbed as much evidence of war crimes from the facility as they could and marched 3,000 slave laborers 50 miles to the southwest in negative 18-degree Fahrenheit winter. Two-thirds two of them died of exposure on the journey. So this was an unusually cold winter, and the Germans were scrambling towards the end of the war to, to, to hide all the evidence of all of these atrocities. So, you know... They had these trails of bodies, too. Uh, that's what the trail of bodies, that's where this comes from, when they started marching these uh, prisoners west from Poland. Now we travel to Middlework. This was an, uh, another underground facility. Hitler had all these underground uh, uh, facilities. This is where they produced the V2 rockets. Why is it that whenever there's a 
forced march by prisoners of war in the winter. It's always the most unseasonably cold winter in like the past five decades. God hates Jews, obviously. I guess so. Or like the, the baton, the baton death march. It was like the hottest, wettest summer that in true? that region. Yeah, it's, it's always like that for some reason. Just whenever, whenever there's a, a, ba- a march, a forced march, it's always in the worst conditions imagined. But basically, this they had these little sort of mini trains, and they would roll down the tracks, and they would build the rockets on these uh, basically train these tiny trains. Sort of assembly line style. <clears throat> this is where the V-2 rockets were assembled in secret by slave laborers from the Dora Nordhausen concentration camp. Here we meet Werner von Braun and Arthur Rudolph. Von Braun was recently promoted after hit moving his offices from Pinamunda to Nordhausen. Was head of a division within Himmler's, S- within Himmler's SS. Von Braun planned to increase V-2 production from a few rockets a day to 200, even as the Reich was on the brink of defeat. At this time, Nordhausen was overrun with prisoners arriving from the east, many of them dead. It was extremely cold and there was no food. Thousands of prisoners were starving to death. Von Braun knew all this. He is documented as having visited the Middlework Tunnel Complex ten times in an in official capacity during 1945. So Von Braun, while he is ha- heralded and hailed as like an American hero, he is a monster also. He just doesn't look like a monster. He looks like a gentlemanly figure i don't know if oh we'll we'll see a picture of him in a minute let me uh, read a uh, excerpt from the book at this point many of the convictions at nuremberg uh stem from nordhausen there's not a whole lot of evidence from of basically crimes from this period a lot of it is uh uh the few evidence they were able to collect was from nordhausen Quote, for the emaciated slave laborers who had managed to stay alive trying to assemble missiles in filthy, unfinished tunnels without food, water, or sanitation in the bitter cold of winter had become more and more difficult, and it showed in their work. In the skies across Europe, these hastily constructed rockets began breaking apart in flight, and in the pine forests of northern Germany, including those around Castle Varlar, quickly assembled rockets were exploding on their mobile launch pads. The managers at Middlework suspected sabotage. To send a message, public hangings were held. Prisoners were hanged up to 57 in one day, read one war crimes report. They were hanged in the tunnels with the help of an electrically controlled crane a dozen at a time. Their hands bound behind their back. A piece of wood was put in their mouth to prevent shouting. The hangings were carried out directly above the V2 production lines. Laborers were forced to watch their fellow prisoners suffer an agonizingly slow death. In solidarity, a group of Russian and Ukrainian prisoners staged a revolt. The suspects were rounded up. Middlework managers and SS guards decided to make an example of them. After these men were hanged, their bodies were left dangling for a day. Only after Arthur Rudolph, the Middlework Operations Director, received a memo from one of the German engineers asking when they were going to get their crane back were the bodies taken down. So this is a lot of the evidence that in Nuremberg, yeah, it's very, very disturbing. I mean, what do you do? You, do you fight? Do you fight and you know, die, because they have weapons, you know, and you're very malnourished. I mean, what do you do? Uh, uh, Yeah, at that point, I don't know. If you're just getting a a hanging death, just show solidarity and and let them hang you, you know. Yeah. If you're you're getting tortured to death the way it is, at least you get a quick death with hanging somewhat quick, quick quickish. I don't know, man. Try to organize and jump a couple SS, get their weapons. I don't know. I don't know what you do. Yeah. (laughs) I think it's just a no-win situation. <laughs> it's just... Slavery's bad. <laughs> we should know this by this point in history. When he's... Yeah. 1940s here. Werner von Braun never faced much criticism in the U.S. and is honored to this day for his contributions to the space program. Um, he was instrumental, supposedly, in the uh, V2 ro- or the uh, the Saturn program. There's a nice photo of von Braun. Well, he is a handsome, cheery fellow. Oh. See how American he is. Look. Yeah, double chin and all. Coca-Cola. He was never directly linked to war crimes. He was, by all accounts, absolutely complicit. Um, I mean, like I said, he visited Middlework ten times in official capacity, documented. They, ugh, I don't know why they couldn't do something about these guys, man. They didn't do something. They, they literally hired him and brought him over here. 
course they didn't do anything. They wanted them. It's more important to be better than the Soviets, basically. That was the whole, that was the whole, that, Andy Jacobson's whole thesis in this, in this book is that the United States, because of the Cold War, they, they would do anything they could to keep these guys from getting to the Soviets, uh, to prop up the Soviets or whatever. Hmm. I don't know how, that, that doesn't necessarily justify any of this in my, in my view. Yeah, I mean, what, what's it'd be the, more justifiable just to take them out, just to assassinate them at that point, wouldn't it be? What's the what's the U.S. has the U.S. given an explanation for why they? I mean, is there a public recognition that these guys were at least some of them were war criminals and that we used their bad now because everybody involved is dead. That's the only reason they released these documents. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, what was the justification? What's like from the U.S.? What, what are we saying? Why this is why we did it? Yeah, they were bad guys, but we needed to. That was it. The internal documents were stating that it was because of fear of the Soviet uh, uh, sphere of influence that we didn't want okay. the Soviets having Just... these guys, and the Soviets also got some of the guys as part of you know they got their hands on as many as they could. So, so geopol. Well, I'm assuming some of it would have been we need to create these weapons. Before they do, or we need to, yeah, I guess the Soviets are working on these weapons, so we need to, we need to be able to protect the world by by producing these weapons first and, and holding uh, holding the Soviets in check. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't only immediately start producing V two rockets; we also immediately started producing tape and nerve gas. That's what we were after. <laughs> Soviets ordered the Soviets. The Soviets uh, they tell they transported an entire tape and nerve gas facility to the Soviet Union and re rebuilt it. Got to have that nerve gas. Apparently. <laughs> it's terrifying. Yeah. I'd rather go out to a nuclear bomb than a fucking nerve gas. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Just let me be vaporized in right. a, a brilliant... Well, pretty light, light. And then you're gone, you know. <laughs> yeah, just... <sighs> if you're close enough to it, if you're not one of the guys that dies of radiation poisoning later. Yeah. If I get radiation poisoning, I can just put a bullet in my head and be done what? with it. As I said, all the guys I mentioned here will be working for the Americans uh, very soon. Uh, Arthur Rudolph directly oversaw the death of some 20,000 so-called Untermenschen. This was uh, Hitler's term for the subhumans. Because all these people, the Soviets and the Poles and the Slavs and the Jews, these were all not considered humans uh, by the Nazi ideology. They were Untermenschen. Untermensch. Arthur Rudolph directly saw, oversaw the death of 20,000 of them by beating, hanging, disease, exhaustion, cold, and starvation. He eventually made his way to NASA to work with Von Braun on the Saturn rockets. He retired in, from NASA in 1969 after receiving two service medals. Uh, he was forced out of the country in 1984 in the midst of an OSI investigation, resulting from information surfacing connecting Rudolph to the Middlework facility and the hangings by the crane that we mentioned earlier. He was forced out of America eventually and made his way to Germany. Um, he lived out the rest of his life there. He was never prosecuted. Um, and his his expulsion from the U.S. was defended uh, uh, by neo-Nazis, Holocaust deniers, and Pat Buchanan. So that was Arthur Rudolph. He was one of the only few that really saw any sort of punishment from this shit. Yeah. We didn't... I mean, I mean there's, there's no real need to get the actual... I can see a justification for saying, hey, this is important military technology. This is, and with all military... Military technological developments. There's a lot of science that's applicable across multiple fields. Um, it seems like you could get that without the people. You know, all you this stuff can. written down. <laughs> um, I'm kind of thinking. So right now, this is reminding me of. Uh, I think it was Unit Seven Three One. This was the Japanese uh, unit that did all sorts of. Uh, is a Unit in the Japanese Imperial Army during World War II that did a bunch of uh, human experimentation and some really really sick stuff. You know, cutting, uh, freezing people's arms, cutting them off to study how the blood flows, and just doing the, the Japanese. Terrible... Yeah, it was. Yeah, I think the it... Japanese are fascist as hell, dude. If you look into and the history, they would you know they would infect women with different diseases, cut the living fetuses out of them just but i don't i don't think we got any so we captured a lot of that uh 
uh, a lot of the documents from Unit 731 when we finally made it over there and, and bombed them and uh, kind of set up our little, what do they call it, the MacArthur, MacArthur rule, uh, post-World War II rule in Japan. Um, but I don't think we brought, we didn't, we didn't bring any of their scientists back. We just captured all the, all the documentation and the literature of the science. And some of it was applicable. Uh, the sick stuff they did, I think a lot of our, a lot of our transplant technology that we started to develop was based on the weird stuff that they were doing. And, and a lot of our frostbite treatment, I think also. From that. There's a lot. Yeah, you, you can with, get the science without yeah. the scientist, without the individual, which is, you know, we did not do. We just let them. There were certain people in the United States government advocating for bringing these people <clears throat> over and the, everyone else went along with it for the most part. Yeah. There was a very few, very few dissenters. There was one or one or two dissenters. Most of the dissent came from the, the, the uh, intellectual elite that were not part of the government in the United States. For example, you know, I, Albert Einstein came to, came to the United States right at the beginning of the Nazi reign because he saw the writing on the wall. He, he got the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. and, he, and after the paperclip scientists were sort of found out, there was a couple big stories written about it, and Einstein spoke out against the paperclip scientists at that point. There was sort of this letter that was written uh, and sent to the government, but you know, all the information wasn't out at that point. We didn't really know the extent of Operation Paperclip. We just knew the names of a couple scientists at that point that had come over that people recognized, basically. Nobody knew about Otto Ambrose or, you know, Von, I mean, people knew about Von Braun, but not his background. The Nazis were very careful to hide as much of what they were doing as they could. And as a result, very few of them saw any any serious legal, legal repercussions. I mean, they, they hung a few of them, but it was sort of lower level guys. The, the upper echelon didn't really see any justice. Yeah. Hmm. We'll get back to this at some point because there's a lot more to tell. There's a lot lot more experiments that were done uh we didn't really even touch on the uh aero medical center folks yet but we'll get there 